He is my friend, Steven Jameson, a.k.a. SJ, all the way from NJ. Used to live in BK. We still in the USA. We are here for a special Father's Day edition of We Are Boss People. I'm joined by my friend, Steven Jameson, dad of four beautiful right. children. How you doing, Steve? Good, my friend. Good, my friend. Glad to be a, a, a guest on your show. Glad to have you. So your children are age range range from ages what to what? Oldest is 13 uh, and the youngest is four. 13 to four. So that means you, you got a teenager and one not even entering kindergarten yet. Right. But she feels like she's a teenager herself. Yep. Right. So, yep. Yeah. She's the boss of the house. The ringleader, the ring yes, leader. <laughs> the finger pointer. He did it, not me. Or uh, can you help me get that? That kind of thing. Yeah. Right. You know, she's a smart one. She knows how to play all the angles. Oh yeah, she does. Yes, she does, man. Yes, she does. All right. So, Steve, let me ask you a question. Uh, when you got married, did you see yourself with? I'd call for, you know, it's not a small family. I don't know if you call it a large family, but did you see yourself as a father of four at all when you first got married? So there's, there's conflicting views to that because Clara would tell you, uh, yeah, um, you always wanted four. And I said, I don't know why I ever said that. But um, I definitely wanted to be a dad. Uh, I definitely wanted to have more than two children because of the fact that I was one of two. And I always felt like the house could be a little bit more noisier uh, and crowded because, you know, although I lived in a home where it was just the four of us, my mom, my dad, my sister and I, uh, I was always in a home with lots of people. So, you know, whenever we met, went to take trips to my grandmother's house in Brooklyn, you know, there was always house full of people. Um, whenever I go to my godmother's house in Far Rockway, there was always tons of people. Whenever I went to my dad's, um, my dad's uh, brother's house, my uncle's house, they they had three kids. So all of us together and other, you know, uh, members of the family was always like a house full of people. So for me, I always kind of enjoyed it. Um, I guess it's kind of like why I enjoy quietly so much um, outside of, you know, the alcohol and music. It's just, you know, the ability to be around so many people enjoy having fun, socializing, sharing stories. So yeah, I've always envisioned having um, more than two kids. Um, I never thought we were going to have four. And I, to be honest, which I remember the day when Clara told me we were going to have them before, I had to sit down and have a glass of wine over that one. But, um, you know, it, it's been a blessing and um, I would never take anything back at all. It wasn't the plan, but I guess it was God's plan. There you go. So uh, as you rolled with the plan, um, you know, sometimes people say the biggest adjustment is between like the first and the second or the second and the fourth. I mean, it's always an adjustment, but for you, what was the hardest jump when you, each time you adjusted to having, a, having a, another one in your family? Biggest adjustment, honestly, was number three, um, because at that point, you have more kids than hands. So you really do rely on having some level of support from you know your 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 spouse you know so you know i think um the biggest thing was understanding you could no longer do something and just like exist in the same room as the kids because there's always one going in another completely direction from the other the other wants to do something else. And so once you get to three, it's a, it's a game changer in terms of how they, their needs and how they maneuver kind of just stretches things out to a whole nother level. Yeah, we found that, you know, so we have three beautiful daughters, but yeah, but the, we get to third, just all the expectations change. You're just trying, you're just trying to keep, you know. Yeah, three no less than you're in the city, man. I mean, I, I listen, I can tell you what, we were in, we were in the Bronx when it was just the three of us, Adrian, our oldest, um, Clara and I, and when we started thinking about having, you know, another child, I was like, there's no way we're going to ever stay in the city because I could never see myself in the subway with the stroller in the middle of rush hour 
you know, trying to tell people like, hey, back up, back up, you know, like, my kid is in the stretcher, come on, you know, my, my, the stretcher, my kid's in the stroller, get out of the way, you know, or like running up and down in 95 degrees, you know, garbage stinking kind of subway, like trying to get through the turnstile, folding the thing up to open it up and all of that other stuff, or waiting 10 minutes for the damn elevator to work if you're lucky enough to be in a station with the elevator. I was like, I'm not going to be that guy. I'm not going to do it. And um, so I was like, yeah, I don't think I'm going to be that kind of person either. So, um, you know, so that's when we started. To, I think that was one of the things, aside from the fact that I was like, we're not going to pay a million dollars for like, you know, a 10 foot backyard. You know, I was like, we got to get out of here. So. Right. But you guys then made the jump to Jersey, which meant you had the commute. So yeah, yeah, yeah. how did you make that work for, I know, so you were, you were, you were both commuting from Jersey into the city with young children for a while. How, how did you work that? Honestly, I look back on those times and I wonder how we did it. <laughs> I think honestly, there's always a point in time where I look back, in our journey in marriage and, and, and having kids. And I say, I don't even know how we did it. I, you know, even like last week, how did we do it? So, um, you know, I think honestly, it's really kind of like what parenthood is in, as an, in a nutshell, right? You just kind of figure it out as you go. There's no manual for it. People kind of tell you what you should do or should be from an overall, like, you know, characteristic standpoint, but you just really kind of, it's, it's one big improvisation, you know, for your entire life. So for us, um, when we were both in advertising at the time, and as you know, advertising is a very crazy demanding job, we were figuring out how do we get to work on time, get to school the kids on time, and then come back to pick them up, and then do the homework and then do the, you know, the, 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 the dinner and the bath and the bed and all of that and fit it all into one day. And I tell you, it was crazy, man. We used to have to put the kids into um, before care for like an hour and drop them off at like 7, 7.15 at the latest, run the cast the train at 7.27 to get to work by like 8.30 to then leave work by 4.45, to catch the 5 or whatever, 5.07, to get home by 5.45, to then run and get to daycare by 6 or aftercare because they close at 6.01. So the minute you're late, they're going to charge you another 5 to $10 for every minute you're late. And, you know, if you're late more than three or four times, they're going to just, dis they're just going to pull the enrollment and be like, sorry, buddy, like, we're not going to be able to, to keep you with the kids or we'll keep the kids here. So it was stressful, man, you know, and obviously kids, kids are, are, are human beings. So there are going to be times where they don't want to, they don't want to leave the house. They don't want to get up or uh, they decide on throwing themselves on the floor because the outfit you gave them, they don't want to wear. Uh, or they get sick in the middle of the day. Um, and it's tough, man. It, it, honestly, there were days where it was just crazy. You feel guilty dropping them off so early, and then you feel guilty taking two hours to pick them up when you get the call that they're sick, and you got to, like, you know, manage the trip back to your house in off-peak hours where the trains are not coming every five to ten minutes. So it's, it was tough, man. It was really, really tough. Right. And both you and your wife were in the advertising side of the um – marketing industry would you say from your both experience that the advertising industry was family friendly meaning that they <laughs> tried to make accommodations to oh, working man. parents so here's what i would tell you right um i was fortunate to work for for good people in many instances not all but many you being one of them obviously marissa who you and i both know we work with um who were understanding, um, but as I think time goes on, when you're in an industry like advertising that's predicated on youth, right, and being able to work different times of the day all the time, because, you know, it's creative, that's how creatives are and all of that. Uh, it's funny how people tend to lack creativity when it comes to being a parent or a working parent, right, and, and how, 
you know, there's only so many times they're going to allow you to call out sick because your kids are sick or you got to go to a doctor's appointment or you got to take a call on the road because you have to do something for your kids. So um, for me, I knew it was going to be something that was going to be a, um, a source of conflict, not only for our marriage, but also in what I wanted to be in terms of a parent, you know, a father for my kids. Right. So, you know, I, I, I had that long conversation with myself of, you know, what's more important, my career or being a parent, like being a dad, like being around, not seeing my kids have a better connection with a nanny or somebody at a daycare um, than me. Right. Or having those moments where I don't know what my son really likes or my daughter really likes because I only see them when I wake them up and when I pick them up and eat, eat dinner with them and then put them to sleep. So, you know, I was a big, that was a big point in my life where I realized probably around early thirties, like, you know, I knew that, you know, you start to look at people in the office, not because of their stature, but like, what does their life look like? You know, and ask yourself, is that what I want my life to look like, right? And, um, you know, for me, I kind of realized at that point I, I needed to figure out another way to kind of create some sense of stability, um, not just financially, but like home, like work balance, home kind of like, right. so that I could manage to, I could feel good doing both. And then I put myself in the predicament that I saw so many others um, do, which was make a decision of one or the other. and then let the guilt kind of just live within them or just kind of tune it out and become this kind of like, I want to say apathetic, but just kind of like disconnected person, you know? So, so that wasn't necessarily a hard decision for you putting some of the career aspirations or looking at them differently because, you know, you wanted to make sure you, you would be there as a father. No, you know, for me, it wasn't really like that, but I, I would say, it isn't that way for everyone, right? For me, it was different because for me, I never looked at my job as my sole motivating factor or sense of fulfillment, right? So for me, it was more of I was doing things because I was passionate about it, but it wasn't my only passion, right? I think many times when you see people, and this is not a knock on anyone, right? And many times you see people who are successful in their careers, they are giving 110%, meaning their sole focus is that, right? And I think that's kind of the price for success that you see, right? Like if you watch the um, the Jordan, the last dance or whatever, although I'm a Knicks fan and I hate the Bulls and I hated Michael Jordan, I think I watched it not only because I was the only thing on TV, but um, I watched it because I, it was interesting to get inside the mind of somebody who was so good at his craft, right? And you realize watching it, how much he gave up in his life in order to become one of the best to ever do it in his his particular um, trade or craft, right? And so if you take that and distill it and just think about it in any kind of, um, you know, trade or skill or career, that's really kind of like what it bubbles down to. How much do you want to make it the center of your life so that you can aspire or rise to certain heights, right? Anybody, right? I think if you watch um, Michelle Obama's Becoming, right? She talked about how much of their life they sacrificed because they felt so passionate about, um, you know, what they felt being in office would do for, you know, the country, right? right? For, for the American people. So, it's a lot, man. And for me, I, I, I just didn't want to get to that point where I was giving any career that much of my life that it became the only thing that was important to me. Now, how about with your marriage? Because uh, maybe I didn't have a necessarily role models, right? I had to do it with dual income, two professionals, with kids, living in an urban environment. So you know, things that you might have picked up is, is either American cultural cues or, or from your family about the way the husband's supposed to be. But that doesn't work when you have a, you know, thankfully an independent, smart, working wife as well. So what kind right. of uh, things did you maybe have to unlearn to make it work with Clara and uh, keep the peace and keep it going? 
I'm still unlearning, brother. I tell you right now. Um, so, and I can tell you that because if you really think about it, our generation, our breed of men right now, we live in, in a completely uncharted territory, right? Like, so you think of our parents, right? That generation, there was a beginning of a dual income household, but in many aspects, for better or worse, in my perspective, many of the jobs that women at that time were getting were very low to maybe mid-level jobs, right? Which started the seed of you can be more than that, which is the kind of independent women that we now are with, married, see in society today, which is a beautiful thing, right? But as a result of that, it isn't until now men um, relationships, right, are starting to realize that now you have the same type of aspirations, same type of equal ground, the same type of, or at least closer, um, uh, uh, will or ability to get to a higher level or pursue your career as far as you want it to go, that you realize how much comes into it, right? And so you then have to come into that really intricate dance step of, you know, figuring out how do you guys move up at the same time and then how do you kind of balance all of the plates, right? Because the, the reality is something's got to give at some point in time. And honestly, it's still something I'm figuring out because there isn't, there isn't a manual for it and there isn't an understanding of do you just let it go for a little bit and then pick it back up? Do you let it go forever, right? It's like I always kind of, when I talk to Claire about this, <clears throat> I, t I talk about it as there's, if you were to look at 24 hours in a day, right? And it's a pie. The pie never gets bigger. It never gets, it never, you know, you never get four pies, you got one pie. And it really comes down to how you cut the slices, right? And so when you cut the slices, you can make them bigger. But if you make them bigger, there's less slices. You can make them smaller, but then, you know, there's smaller slices. So you have to always figure out how exactly are you going to spend your day, right? And the more things that you do, the less time you have to do everything. So you have to make choiceful decisions, right? And then not only do you have to make those decisions for yourself, but then you have to do it in ten with other people, which is a very difficult thing for anyone, right? When you go from being independent to I do whatever I want, I do it my way, screw everybody else, to now you have to compromise with somebody else. And then, you know, the little ones that are around you, where, you know, they pretty much suck up all your day, you know, if, if they really could because they're relying on you so much. So it's a, it's a dance, man. It's a TBD, WIP, you know, DIY kind of situation. So um, Everybody, everybody's experience is unique, um, but I can tell you honestly, the biggest thing that you can hold back, you can kind of le lean back on is the, the love that you have for each other and the fact that, you know, at the end of the day, you guys share the same desire of, of making each other happy, right? And everything evolves with time, you know, parenthood, marriage, personal aspirations. You just got to find ways to make it work day in and day out. And it's not easy, man. So how, how have you noticed, like, what have been your cues when you've been out of balance or you either need to make sure that you're taking better mm -hmm. care of yourself or that maybe one of your kids might, you know, need a little more attention? But just first about you, like, what have been, how have you noticed when, okay, I'm uh, red zone, <laughs> red zone, I, I need to, I need to pull back a little bit? Uh, when the drinks go down too easy, uh, I, I would say, um, not being able to sleep at night or finding myself just getting up um, for no reason. Um, I would also say being short, like being just angry for no reason. And also, um, I find that um, to be something uh, where I kind of say, you know, I got to kind of chill out for a little bit. Um, but honestly, sometimes it takes my wife or my kids telling me, you know, like, hey, what's going on? You know, like my last job, I, I was um, working so much um, and thinking so much about work um, that, you know, I think it was one day the kids were like, Daddy, what's going on with you? You seem like you're angry all the time. And I was like, wow. 
I didn't realize how much I was kind of creating that kind of energy for my kids and for most likely my wife too, you know, for Clarence. So that made me kind of look back and be like, I'm not going to be like this. Right. And so um, sometimes it's just other people you love being around you telling you like, what's going on? You know, and then be like, ah, I don't know, I don't know. like, what do you mean? Like, I can time, I can totally see it. And you sit back and say, huh, yeah, I guess something is going on. So. And what have you found works for you to kind of pull you back to center? Uh, I would say I'm still working on it because it wasn't something that um, uh, was a common practice uh, of my dad's when and nor my mom when they were working. But I try to take days um, to just be by myself, um, find time to kind of separate myself from from everybody um so like for example um one of my good friends he does and he's a teacher um he he has these moments where he's like yo you know what it's kind of crazy out here right now i feel like i'm stressed out i'm gonna call out sick screw it i'm gonna take a day off for me because i feel sick so i'm gonna take a day off right so um exactly so he would take a day off and he would literally just you know, stay home and relax, you know? And I think um, I often felt the guilt of doing that. And I honestly still do this. I'd be like, why don't you just take a day off? And I'm like, no, I'm not sick. So I'm not taking off. But um, if you really think about it, taking a day off here and there actually really helps you recharge your batteries, man. So for me, when I get to those moments where I'm like, yo, this is crazy. I will literally tell my wife, look, I'm going to take tomorrow off or whatever it is. Um, I am not going to be doing jack. Don't ask me to do a honey-do list thing item. Don't ask me to do nothing. Like, the kids are going to school when, of course, that was the case, right? Um, and I'm just staying home and chilling. Like, right. I'm going to read a book, go for a walk, whatever it is, right? And, and I would do it that way. I love that. I love that. Um, now, raising your kids, is there anything that you feel that you learned from your parents or you took from you from from your background that you really want to make sure you pass on to your kids and you're raising them in a certain tradition and the other side of that is there anything that you realize nope don't need that 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 was kind of an old way of doing things and you know and I, I'll give you an example just from I think we talked about this uh, you know we're we're grateful and blessed to have uh, my wife's mom um, in our family and she's there every day um, but we also realize that kind of expectations of what kids are supposed to do and, and be like are different, especially for young girls. So, you know, where, where she has a, we would say sometimes, you know, she wants them to be quieter, which we get, <laughs> but she would appreciate if they were just more of the, you know, yes, grandma, and just, just be silent and listen, but they have opinions right. and, and we would encourage that time to think and use their right. voice. And right. so, you know, we're about that because we want them to, to be able to go out in the world and, and say what they're about and, and not just, you know, not to be taught to, to just sit silently. Um, so that's an adjustment, even as we're trying to understand, you know, how to make it all work and, and what she deems to be respectful behavior and navigating all that. Right. What about for you? Any, any examples along well, those lines? It's so funny you say that because I was actually sitting down Last night in the backyard with Clara, we were, um, I made a little fire and I had the fire pit going. We were talking about that very same thing on how I grew up. My mother was very like, do what I tell you. Do it just this way. Follow directions, right? And um, I was telling, you know, Clara, I said, you know, I don't want our kids to grow up like that. You know, I realized as I got older, that many of the people who are, um, I don't want to say successful, but they're at higher positions within their career are people who are able to operate outside the norm. They're able to feel comfortable doing things their own way. They're able to say like, no, I don't agree with you. That's not a great idea. I think this way is the better idea and be comfortable with disagreeing or having people tell them like, no, nah, that's a bad idea. I'm like, all right, we'll see, right? Um, because they're confident enough in what they think is right and they're okay with opposition 
and they're able to define themselves and get farther ahead in their careers, right? And so I was telling Clara, I was like, I want the kids to feel like that. I don't want to be disrespectful because they get smacked in their mouth, right? But I do want them to feel like they can they can be confident within themselves and they can be them they can feel okay doing things a different way going a different way right because if you don't have that kind of mentality you then often find yourself living in self-doubt or following others and never separating yourself truly from the pack right and being your own in your own self you're just within a system that's been created by people who are independent and are at the top, right? And so um, that was one of the things we, we actually talked about last night that we continue to kind of figure out because again, it's not something we were raised with. And like you said, as kids, they, as they start to develop their own kind of independence, sometimes go a little overboard with it. So you have to figure out ways to rein them in. But that's one of the things that we're constantly trying to figure out how do we create um, within them in a, um, a healthy, a healthy dose so that they understand the situations by which they need to kind of operate in that kind of thing. But I would say the one, the one thing, um, aside from that, we also thought of, we're also trying to figure out is how to be respectful to people, not because they're elders, but they're being respectful to you. Right. Um, and at first that was something that, um, Clara had brought to me and I was like, "Eh, I don't know if I agree with that. But then when she made her point, I understood why she said that, right? Because um, the point she was making was just because you're older doesn't mean um, you're wiser. It doesn't mean you're nicer, you know, or doesn't mean that, you know, you should get the free card and being a jerk to somebody and somebody should take it. Right. So you know, what you should do is be respectful to everybody, right? You know, be respectful to those who are respectful to you um, so that you can share the respect each, with each other versus show respect to somebody who's not going to show you any respect, right? Like, mm, not to say I've been in any of those, you know, jobs or name any names, but places where people may be at higher positions and because they're at a higher level, or feel like they have more respect within an organization of peers because of their status, they feel entitled to talking to you a certain way and that you should be okay with taking it, right? And so, um, or just people who sometimes take advantage of, of, you know, people, you know, and having the kids understand that you should not be disrespected. It's not okay to be disrespected. You need to stand up for yourself. You have to do it in the right way. Again, it's another teaching of like, there's there's a certain way of of telling people you feel disrespected and you're not gonna take it, um, and it doesn't have to necessarily end in fisticuffs when somebody disrespects you, right? You could say it in a polite way and and, and make your point um, make your point heard, um, but you got to do it in a good way. So those are the two things we're trying to modernize within our family um, with our kids. I guess the thing I would keep is. Um, the biggest thing is treating everyone um, with love, um, being compassionate, um, and thinking about others first before you think about yourself. Um, like one of the things that you know, I, even though I wasn't in a large household, um, I did obviously spent a lot of time with my cousins and things of that nature. And one of the things we always kind of prided each other on was you, you go to the store, like, you know, grandma gives you um, five dollars, right? Go to the bodega. You go with your other cousins, you split up the five dollars, right? You get the quarter water, you get the, uh, the super long icy, you know, maybe you get the coconut flavor. They got it right. Um, you get a couple of candies like gumballs and all of that. Right. Um, Spread the love. But- Right, but you share it amongst each other, right? And so you figure out ways to, you get a toy, right? You share it with somebody. Um, you know, like, and if you don't, and you go complain to your aunt and your uncle, you know what they do? They take it away from you and say, well, then nobody gets it. And now y'all guys are going to sit there and look at each other because you didn't know how to share, right? So I think that's one of the things that we, 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 I definitely value and I hold, 
I hold to us. I think another thing that yeah, uh, we hold also is it's it's it goes in line with respect, but it's different. Like you know, in, in my in my upbringing, I was fortunate. In, in Clara and I actually had a very big conversation about it, a deep one, um, last week as we were talking about you know all of the civil unrest going on in the country with George Floyd and, and you know the protesting and the riots and whatnot. And you know, for me, I always grew up in a household where color never meant anything. You know, like both my mother and my father, although they're both light skinned, um, they both came from humble beginnings. You know, my mother came from the projects in downtown Brooklyn. Um, and my father came from the projects in Staten Island. And so my father, you know, red hair, light skin, freckles. My uncle tells me like they were the lightest people in the neighborhood. Right. But you know, everybody treated each other with respect, right. Because you were part of the neighborhood. Right, it didn't matter where you came from. Same thing with my mother. She's Puerto Rican, but she's she's lighter than me, man. So and uh, and I'm light as hell, as you can tell on the video. So, uh, but everybody, no matter who they were, what color their skin was, they all treated the same. Right, when they walked up, when they walked, when they walked in the neighborhood, because you're part of the neighborhood, right? And so that's kind of how we grew up, you know. And honestly, there's many different shades across my family, um, especially on my mother's side. You know, my godmother is is a dark skinned Cuban. Um, her her twin sister's the same, obviously, and they're like she's like my second mother. You know what I mean? So, I've always grown up with that understanding, um, and that's another thing that we always talk about in the house that I, we never change, and I I make it a point to not change. Is we don't look at anybody differently regardless of what their skin color is. Um, people are people, you know, and you all treat them with respect. So. So have you had conversations, uh, at least with your 13 year old, about what the phrase Black Lives Matter means and what's going on in the country? Yeah. And it's <laughs> it's crazy because there were points at time when, you know. I would get a little angry at the fact that he was oblivious to it, but then I also had to take a moment to take a step back and understand where that kind of obliviousness is coming from. One to say, well. I need to point with the thumb and realize, well, part of that may be because I'm not doing a good job as a parent in educating him. And this was a wake up call for me to kind of be a little bit more, uh, I guess, uh, provide a little bit more consciousness to him. Right. Um, and three, it also gave me a perspective of where the rest of America, um, not all of it, but, many instances this could be the place the the kind of thing that they're going through too right where if it's not if it's not affecting them or they haven't experienced it then for them it's it's hard to to understand and and get a kind of sense of perspective on where all of this emotion could be coming from that they're seeing on the tv right and um you know we had a we had a big conversation about it um it, I would say the conversation's been a consistent one over the past couple of weeks, but it's grown in length and description as the time has gone on. Because as you know, as the events have unfolded, um, more and more action is you know getting taken place across America. So we had a, we had a conversation about it the first week. Then we had in church the past two weeks we stream. Um, they actually dedicated two services to talk about it and they brought people in um who are from not are within the church but on other parts of the you know like other parts of the, of the u.s to speak to it and speak to their own personal experiences and from those conversations we usually at the end of church we always talk about like well what did you get from church what did you see from it what did you hear from it so we've had dialogues like that and then recently last week we actually had um we had um, a protest in the, uh, we had a march actually in town. And so we actually had the kids, you know, obviously observing social distancing, had them participate in so they could see what history looks like to see what it is, to, you know, to actually feel so strongly about something that you're going to be vocal about it and you're going to get together with people in your community and you're going to talk about it. So, um, you know, and ask them, like, what did you feel like walking down the streets? What did you feel like seeing all of these people come together and talk about these things? So, um, and then honestly, um, it made me 
reflect a little bit more of like what the society is going through, right? Like, I don't know if this has been the case for you guys in Brooklyn, but like in my, my son's eighth grade um, classes, nobody talked about it at all. Not even in history class where you would think they would talk about it. Had anybody given any conversation of like, what have you guys been seeing on TV? What have you been feeling? Like, what's your perspective on this? How does this relate back to things that have happened in history? Like, nobody. I didn't get an email from the principal, the superintendent, PTA, nothing. Nobody had talked about it at all. And I thought that that was really strange because I can remember living in a time where OJ, uh, Rodney King, um, that we talked about it in school. You know, and just because you're at home and you're having to live in Zoom meetings doesn't excuse the fact that you don't at least send an email or have a conversation in video conference about it, right? But nobody, I, I don't know if it's for fear of liability or like, again, because they feel like that doesn't happen in their neighborhood or they don't see it, that they need to talk about it. But I just found it really, really weird, man. So we've been having lots of conversations about it and um, it's been... It's been weird, man, you know, but it, it's been a good wake-up call to constantly keep it top of mind for the kids so that they see it. And, and it's definitely a little fire under myself and, and Clara and making sure that we always keep it top of mind moving forward. Because I don't think we realized how oblivious not only our kids, but the rest of society was to this because of the fact that they never have been exposed to it to that level. Because for Clara, though, she's definitely, she's, she's experienced it. Like, she's had to live it many, many more times than than I could even imagine. Um, and she, she's known what it's felt to be discriminated and put down and be made lesser than and call names and stuff like that. And she was like, you know, she wants the kids to understand how long it is. So right. it's been a real, real interesting journey the past couple of weeks. On the culture side of, of what you're sharing with your kids, if they grow up and go to a family party, what song do you want to make sure that when it comes on, they know this is the song that they have to know the lyrics to and have to dance to? What What are you schooling your children about, Stephen? Uh, well, it's definitely Spanish music. So as long as it's something in Spanish, I tell them it's good. We definitely lead with the salsa first. We'll probably do like some um, Hector Lavo or some like Ismael uh, Rivera. Um, which is old school salsa. So uh, definitely that. Um, my daughter, who's seven, the, the older one of the two, she's already got the whole reggaeton thing down. So she's, she's gotten me motivated to working out and making sure that I stay in shape when she gets older because she be making she be making me really, really um, think about going to the gym because I'm going to have to break somebody's arm or something. So uh so those would be the biggest things i think i want the kids but definitely for me it's more of i've always and so as, as clara we've always had this um the importance of the kids being rooted culturally like understanding where they came from understanding language understanding that more than anything else and so i think um that's the biggest thing i want the kids to kind of make sure that they always understand especially when it comes to music because that's such a big part of um you know hispanic culture so when you and clara um talk about what everything that you're doing for your kids everything that you're putting into them um what are your hopes for your kids and i and i mean i, I what i hear from you i know you're not the type of guy who's doing all this just so that your kids can get say a better career or a better job or have a higher income than say you know you, you might have been able to to achieve for yourself when you think about what your hopes and your dreams for your kids are, what is that? What, what do you think about? What is what does that look like to you? You know, you, you'll you'll be able to rest content when you know that your children are fill in the blank. When my children know that life is limitless for them, you know, when they understand that there's nothing that gets in the way other than themselves, when they can whatever day or time it is, come up with an idea and say, you know what, I'm gonna do it. Right. So that they don't feel like they need to get someone's approval to do something that they really feel strongly about. Right. So that for me in and of itself is 
is the core tenet of what Clara and I strive every day to give the kids, right? Is the understanding that when you need to do something, don't make excuses and don't let anybody tell you you can't do it. You can do it as long as you really put your heart to it and you feel that passionate about it to make it happen. Right? Like not everybody is going to be um, book smart. You know, not everybody is going to want to work in a white collar job. Um, and some people are not going to be comfortable working for someone else. Right. And so that's totally fine. They can do whatever it is that they want to, but in, in doing that, they have to understand the mindset of knowing that nothing can get in their way. One, and two, the responsibility that comes with it, right? Because I think one of the things that I know I've experienced with, you know, the younger generation that had come into the workforce um, was that they're very, it's this weird combination of they want to do whatever it is they want to do, but then they want to be told how to do it, you know, or you know, I want to speak my mind. And it's like, all right, buddy, speak your mind. And guess what? I don't like your ideas. So now you're going to have to do it this way or that way. Right. So, or just, you know, like they want to do something, but then it's like, all right, we'll go do it. Well, I don't know how to do it. Well, then why, why, <laughs> why did you have to do it then? Right. So it's, it's one of those things of like, you know what, there comes responsibility with freedom. Right. And so, you know, and, it's up to you if you want that freedom to be responsible in, in how you use it, right? And, and not make excuses of like why you can't do this or do that. Like own your own freedom and, and understand the consequences that come with it, you know? Own your own freedom. That is the phrase. I, I, don't, know, I don't know where to go from there. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that. And, and if uh, on Father's Day they ask me, uh, you know, any advice, I'm just going to say, you know, a wise man once told me, <laughs> own your own freedom. And I'm not going to explain it. I'm just going to drop the mic, walk away. Yeah. All right. Father's Day, are you grilling or chilling? What are you doing? Oh, uh, I'm doing both, man. Um, I'm pro So I already got two grills. Um, that's another thing that I love about home ownership. I got a place I can go to the backyard and I can grill and I don't have to worry about, well, if I have a porch, you know. That's not part of the, the building code. You're not supposed to be grilling outside or going out on the sidewalk and then somebody telling me like, yo, you know, that's not really allowed in the neighborhood kind of thing. So um, I got a, a charcoal grill and I got a, a gas grill in the back, but I was thinking about getting a smoker um, this, this Father's Day and then getting a nice brisket and letting that thing just grill nice and slow man at like 225 in direct heat a couple of hours it's just like turn into this beautiful soft meat that just comes right off you know like i don't even need a fork it just like i just go like this with my hands and it just just comes right off man so uh i definitely go chill um while i'm grilling probably have a nice beer in the backyard to stay out as much as i can in the backyard um, and that's it, man. How about you? What are you going to do? Oh, I don't even know. I don't even, you know, <laughs> options aren't, uh, I'm mad at you for talking about your two grills. <laughs> about getting the smoker. Yeah, we're, I'm going to go well, out. You can go to uh, Prospect Park with the little circles and just like stain your circle or well, like we, lose your mind. And go yeah, outside Prospect the circle. Park. We did that. I, I did. I, I brought the grill in a little granny cart once, man. It almost killed me. It was, you got you to gotta find parking, <laughs> then you got to schlep the thing up the hill. You got to go in. I mean, right. I know people do it, but um, right. I, right. I don't know yet. We're, we're, we're going to make it. We're going to make it nice, though, one way or the other. How has it been for you guys in the city going through, through everything the past couple of months, starting with COVID and then getting into, obviously, all of the, the protests and the marches and things like that in the neighborhood? Um. It, no joke. I mean, in the beginning, it was scary. It was, it was, it was sirens nonstop. The thankfully, the kids didn't really um, pick up on it as as much as we did, or even if they did, it, you know, we didn't notice it as much. Um, you know, the joke that I keep on saying is that for us in the beginning, it was like a mashup of The Office meets Little House in the Prairie meets like High School Musical. Like they they're singing their songs and they're twirling and having a good time because you know they're home and ooh now 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 we have you know 
devices that we can use. You know, the school sent devices, so they they were like, "This is great! You never let us do this before." Um, but yeah, it was it was it was stressful. You said, you know, you couldn't get to bed before a certain hour, and it's hard to shut off. And and um, even if you didn't watch the news, the, the ambulance is just going up and down the street. You know, three four times an hour was was enough to let you know that it was kind of nuts. So wow, man. Yeah, thankfully things things have stabilized. Um, I think you know at different times we saw the um, our family react in different ways. So trying to be sensitive to that, but also know that we want to try and keep them to some kind of structure and, and keep keep things going. So like you said, it's just been flexible and and adjusting. And um, yeah, like we've you know we we talk about things that I know that my family had to do. So when you, I know um, my dad and their generation, you know, a lot of things, they just made it work. So that's one thing that we're trying to pass on to them when they're talking about, oh, you know, one of them said something about, I don't know if they used this exact word, but it was like the summer's ruined because things that they might've planned to do, they can't do. And we said, no, 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 it's not, it's different. Right. It's not ruined, but we're gonna make it work and we're gonna have fun, you know, so. Right. It may not be what you plan, but that's what we do. We we adjust and we roll and 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 you know as the more that you know we use that language and we're talking to ourselves, right? We're like, it's not ruined. Like we're <laughs> no, honey, like, it's not ruined, right? It's not ruined. It's gonna be different this year. That's right. right. It's just gonna be different. It's just gonna be different. It's just gonna be different. <laughs> um, but the more we've used that kind of language to them, you know, the more that we hear them every now and then say that and, and figure out how. Uh, they're gonna, you know, and we've seen them. They've been like really creative at times. They've done things that that have amazed us. Um, you know, everyone gets on everyone else's nerves. It's a small space, so um, definitely made us think about the move to the burbs a little more closely. A little more closely. Um, the the our oldest, who's who's turning ten in August, has a little corner of of their share room. So she's like, "This is my corner, right? This is how you do it. you fight over real estate. This is her corner." Can't go in her corner. It's her corner. <laughs> she has a corner. Other children may have their own rooms. She has her corner. Okay. Thing, that's for her corner. Hey, and then hey. we, you know, and we respect that. You can't. That's that's her little peace of mind. Um, but you know, like I said, that that's with with the amount of people who've you know been on the front lines and 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 the amount of people who've been sick. You know, when you when you're able to work from home and you have food and everyone's healthy, what what can you say? But you're you're thankful and you're blessed and you just um, you know, adjusting and, and, and making it all work. So, uh, um, how's the virtual schooling been for you? Interesting. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> they've adjusted, they've adjusted. Um, but How you know, you it's, your wife adjusted cause I'm sure that's been a very interesting dynamic. Well, that, that's, but that, that's part of it where it's like, I mean, I, I wouldn't say, I would never say things are 50 50 because I know there are things that, that I know that my, my wife does that I, I don't even count. So I'm not insane, but we have a shared responsibility. I'll put it that way. We have a shared responsibility. <laughs> Times that have lived up to that shared responsibility, but we, we divided and conquered. We said, all right, you, you helped this one this day. You helped that one the other day. And, um, you know, you make it work. So I'm sure like with you, it's, it's we don't, we don't have a space where there are offices that we can shut ourselves into. We're kind of all in the same space. And, you know, you have to make a choice. Like, you know, there might be an email that I was working on or something I want to finish. But, you know, if I've ignored my daughter two or three times in a row and said, I can't help you, you know, I know I can't keep doing that it, because I have responsibility to work. But I, I also know that if I keep, if my daughter keeps on telling, keeps on hearing, I, I just no, 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 and sees my face in a screen, like that's going to have an effect. Mm -hmm. in other ways, even if she, if she gets the work done, you know, on her own or, or someone else helps her. So I've had to check myself when it would be easier for me just to try and work on something um, where I was like, no, I have, to, I have to pull myself out of what I'm doing and actually be present with her because that's, that's more important. Um, you know, and I, I, I've had to catch myself and, you know, you get frustrated because you don't feel as productive as you could be or should be. And, you know, back your head if you're worried about your job and what if I'm not showing productivity, but mm -hmm. you know, it's just, you're making, it's like you said, it's a lot of little choices and making it up DIY, you know, as you go and just, you know, just taking care of one day and moving on to the next. Um, so. so how do you coach yourself out of those moments? Cause I think we all 
Oh, especially now with the phone where you can easily get distracted, whether it's work or otherwise, how do you pull yourself out of those moments and be truly present with your kids, right? Because it's easy to say in theory or envision it happening. You know, you see yourself smiling and laughing with your kids and playing shoots and ladders, like in a commercial where it's like, ah, good job, Billy. And then like real life hits and you're like, I got to do the clothes, get lunch ready, um, follow the schedule, jump on the conference call, get the homework done. You know, how do you find the time to pull yourself out and allow yourself that grace and allow the kids that grace of being a kid and connecting with them in that kind of manner? Because it can be very difficult. Like I could tell you before I let you chime in, like as much as I love having four kids, we are literally running an operation every day oh it is absolutely schedule it's gonna take 20 minutes in and out let's go move it on and sometimes in doing that we don't allow ourselves the opportunity to just like be with each other because we're so focused on if we don't if we're late for this the rest of the day is completely screwed you know right. so how do you how do you pull yourself out uh, well so on the operation side it's just <laughs> we've we've known we know if it, like if if you want to keep the house up and running, then you have to sacrifice some things for either yourself or time with them, right? There's no way, or at least I don't know any any how anyone else does it unless you're up at four in the morning, but that you can keep your house clean, keep your, you know, meals coming that are healthy and, and prepared and 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 keep order and spend time with your children and not you know, it's something has to give. So there are days and weeks when you're like, all right, well, that's just how it's going to look. And, but that's okay because we spent time together watching something, you know, as a family. So, um, you know, there, there have been meals that, you know, have just been, it is what it's, what's in the fridge. It's what's in the fridge. What's in the fridge that I don't know. You got to look, it's what's in the fridge. What's for dinner. It's what's in the fridge. As my wife right. says, hungry people eat. So, yeah. hey. you know, there's stuff in the fridge. I can't tell you what's in there or that it's going to make a coherent meal, but there's stuff in the fridge. So, you know, make it work. And then you, you just can't feel guilty about that because, again, you know that in order, you know, meal prep and, and getting fresh ingredients, one, you know, going to the grocery store isn't like what it used to be. So you're not in the store as much. So, you know, there's those limitations. And um, it's the part, baby. Should have got that stuff. Well, COVID popped off, man. Instacart, yeah, yeah. crazy, man. Um, but you know, as, as you're sure, you said, like, I, I feel, you know, the phrase is "get out of the kitchen." The kitchen is closed. <laughs> get out of the fridge. And then <laughs> you know, because it's a, like we went grocery shopping a day ago. How is it gone? How is yeah. it gone? Right. right. You know, it's funny. Then, I, I saw like the father from Everybody Hates Chris, where he's like, "That was two dollars and twenty-five cents worth of juice that spilled on the floor." What are exactly. you doing? Exactly. You already had two tall glasses. That's it. Water for the rest of the day. I said no, no juice, no, ju no juice, no, 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 no juice. Just water. Um, and then we're like, it's cool. You are not eating grapes all during the day. You, I know you're not sitting there during math, just chomping on grapes all day long. Right, um, right. But you know, pull yourself back. I think the one thing that we we try to do um, is at, have. Have a meal time where we're actually sitting down at the table. That's the nice thing that, you know, when you were talking about the commute, you know, some of those nights you're just, you're just in such a rush. And then, you, you know, you're barely even spending time with them at the table because you're, you're yourself just, that's the first time you're sitting down. So being able to sit down together, that's been the one time where make a conscious effort. There's no, you know, my phone is not visible. <laughs> my wife makes sure her phone is not visible. Like, you know, we're all just sort of, looking at each other's faces during the day it, it's hard to to try and figure out what you know we, we there's just a time when we realize okay everyone's been scattered let's all try and gather in the same space at least and and um it's like things that we never used to do like you know watching wheel of fortune it's like oh wheel of fortune is on let's, let's all watch it together you know um <laughs> Or like, the, you know, all the kind of like cheesy family game shows. Like I, I never, I never sat, like we all sat down and watched American Idol one night. You know, it's, it's, I never right. watched American Idol, like from my own view. I know it's like, but all of a sudden now you're excited as a family. Let's all watch. Um, 
So it's just finding whatever moments that we can and making sure um, that you're that you're aware of kind of where you are in your day. So like you said, you know, if you've been so focused on meeting the schedule and you're great because they, they, they're caught up on their, their school stuff and, you know, there's some order to the house, but wait a minute, I haven't actually like said to them, how are you doing today? Right. Mm -hmm. So then you got to pull back. And then, you know, sometimes I'm sure you've seen it means, well, you know, I wanted to work on something, maybe, oh, all right, I got to work on it at 10 o'clock, you know, it, because y you just, you have to, you, you, you're sharing the same space. So, you have right. to at times show them that you're there, you're aware that you see them, that, you know, you're, you're responding to the picture that they made and you're giving them feedback. Um, Cause otherwise, you know, even if they don't say anything right away, you know, that it, it's creating like a, an impression on, on them and, and, and seeing what, seeing what, they're watching you watching what you value. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so, you know, I mean, I, I know that they could, when they, if, if they go back to school in the fall and they're going there, how was it? And they're talking to their friends, you know, the thing, the thing that would break my heart, it was like, oh, it's fine. You know, my parents just worked a lot. Like if mm -hmm. that's all they say, they just worked a lot. Wow. That would, that would be a heartbreaker, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. We do have to work, right? There is, there is, there's a responsibility and a commitment both for your, you know, your own professional pride, not even just worrying about, um, you know, job loss, but just, but if that's all they take away from this time, then, then, you know, we didn't do the right thing by them. Right. Right. So what, what, what have you been doing or how have you guys been having conversations with the kids about, you know, all of the, the civil unrest that's been going on, the protests and the marching, the stuff in the news and all this crazy stuff with the president and police, the tear gas and all other stuff like what kind of conversations have you been having with the kids? I mean, obviously, it's got to be a very, very, um, a very unique conversation for you guys as well because of the fact you're both, you guys are a multicultural uh, family, just like myself and, and Clara, right? So, right. like, what have you been doing in terms of the kind of conversations you've been having? Yeah, I mean, we, with our, our oldest daughter, who, again, who's turning 10 in August, um, after about a week of, I think the first week of, of um, Mr. Floyd's death, we, we were absorbing it, right? It's a lot for us to take in and managing your own emotions and everything. And then we realized, okay, we need to have a conversation with her to let her know what was going on. So that was, that was I think we had that Friday night and then Saturday, we were we were out and about. We just wanted to go for a drive, and you know, you're flipping radio stations, and um, you know, they have the news break. So she heard more about that, and she said, "All right, what's that about?" So we knew, all right, when we get home, we got to have a conversation with her. And so, you know, we we didn't um, show her the video, obviously, but um, told her what was going on, and let her stay up and watch the news a little bit with us and answer some questions, and you know, and, and we wanted to let her know that. Um, it's not all about struggle. It's not all about, you know, what people are, 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 are doing to us or, or doing um, that, you know, when you look even at American history, that it's not just someone did something to us. And so then this is how we respond with the protest. You said, look, you come from a line of people who have made a lot out of a little at times, and there's genius and there's creativity. So to understand that if, um, she identifies, you know, she's, she is, my wife is a black woman. She is a black woman. Um, so to understand that, you, that the, your history is not limited to simply protesting and standing up for your rights and, and looking at, you know, the, the history of injustice. There's a whole other side of things that is, is beautiful and creative. So getting her to have a balanced point of view, but, you know, she cried. She, 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 it was a lot for her to take in. Um, but then the next week she had a conversation in school. They actually, you know, opened up in, in, in Zoom and, and we were proud of her. She spoke up and she, she talked about how she felt and she used her voice. And then she dealt with the fact that not everyone necessarily has the same point of view, uh -huh. which is, you know, a how good- How do you deal with those emotions as a parent hearing that as like you're working, but like part of your ear is like, what did they just say right now? Like, well, that's exactly what it was. You know, we were like, we were, you know, we were both like listening in. Um, 
but you know that that's part of it too you know we've you know like i think you and i experienced it even you know being in the same office like you you say okay i think we have this perspective and someone says no that's not an issue and you say okay and you learn how to process that and what you do with it and um and so she you know it, it she then had a conversation with some of her other friends who who were more kind of of you know had a similar point of view and they learned how to encourage one another and how to support one another so she's learning you know at this age it's not about um you know that everyone is going to agree with you and that's okay and how to find support and and seek out support and you know ask ask your friends for help so that those are great lessons that that she's going through but it's hard you know it's 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 a lot for her to process and um we're also happy that we can actually you know be in the same space to do so um mm. but you know we're, we're all still trying you know this like you said dy like man man like figuring out how to get yourself through mentally through a lot of this stuff um let alone your own family is is not easy so my the one thing that i've been able to do is is uh when you know we are having family meals is is cook you know it's not always a masterpiece as we say but that's been you know you're doing something with your hands i i don't have a house to go in the backyard a lawn to mow or you know um but but you know getting in the kitchen that that's been a little little personal space for me just to you know put on some music you're having a good time that's that's time just to like just sort of sort of clear out and um and then and then with my oldest you know i've cooked with her a little bit so she's in the kitchen with me so that's time together we've enjoyed that um so yeah you know just they're finding little little family moments things that you know we didn't do before whether it's um you know trying to create little rituals where we can that's 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 worked for us so far that's nice man that's nice good massive improvisation Bobby <laughs> That's what it is. It's improv, right? And it's it's improv, and it's like just being okay. It's like there's a there's there's a there's a lot of dirty clothes there. You know, I'd say one thing that that, that um I think has come out uh, of this this whole situation with George Floyd, Floyd and being at home also through COVID nineteen is um the ability to showcase the kids all of the different spectrums of what reality is right in life both good and bad right because i think one of the things that i always pride um myself in doing as a parent and as well as clara does and i think sometimes she probably is lying a little bit with her but um it's being real around the kids you know like showing them what real marriage is meaning Sometimes we're gonna have arguments, and the kids are gonna see that. And we're like, oh man, look at these guys! You know, when they get real quiet because they know daddy and mommy are arguing like a mother, right? Or, you know, honestly, I curse a lot, and I curse in front of the kids, and the kids are like, "Dad, you're not supposed to be cursing." I'm like, "I got a job. I can curse." Okay, when you get a job, and you start making money, and you got tax, you know, tax taken out of your check, and you gotta pay a bill. Then you can curse in this house to the world. I can curse. Get a job, and then you can curse, right? Um, or, you know, seeing seeing uh, me have a drink, right? Mm-hmm. So that they understand, like, okay, that has alcohol. So that when they get older and they see it, it's not the first time. They understand how to be responsible around it. They understand, you know, that there there's a lot of things you need to be mindful of. Um, and feeling comfortable being in their house around us, and being themselves, you know, like we really try to to to, to really um, we really try to and preach that um, and practice it as well amongst the kids. Of like, just be yourself, be real. There's gonna be good and bad. You just gotta get through it, especially with all the stuff that's been happening on the TV and in the news with George Floyd. Right? It's like showing like talking the kids through things that are really horrible and be like, you know, there's unfortunately going to be things that happen in your life that you may not get. And it's unfortunate, but these are things that happen in life, man. And you got to be prepared for it. You got to understand what it is, right? And understand that that is wrong, right? And rather than just be like, oh, it's something on the news. Like, yeah, that's that was on the news, but that could be like 
real life tomorrow when you're walking the streets. So you got to understand that it, although it seems distant, it's really close, you know. So, um, so I think that's one of the things that we we always try to to keep like real close to us and try to practice every day because you know I think it is sometimes really good for the kids to see imperfection you know, at its best, if that makes any sense. You know, the kids got to understand that life is not perfect and that striving for a perfect uh, life ultimately leads to your downfall faster than if you were to just take the disappointments that come, the missteps, and learn how to take them in stride and grow from them. You know, right. so we, we, we try to do that every day. Um, I didn't share this with you, but, you know, I'm sure you've seen where your kids try and do something and then it's not the way that they thought it would look, so they get upset. Sometimes, mm -hmm. based on their personality, some of them might get more frustrated than others. So even me creating, kind of doing these video interviews was something that I'd thought about, but just thought about didn't do. And one of the reasons I did them is I was telling my kids, well, it doesn't have to be perfect. You know, mm -hmm. just, just go ahead and do it and see where it goes and flow with it. And I realized, and, okay, the things that I'm telling my daughters, <laughs> Gotta be doing. Am I doing? <laughs> right. And right. like you said, and, and it's 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 for them to see it, you know, is is much more powerful. And so um when I put the site up for this and I showed my daughter, she was like, Oh, wow, that's that's your you did that. And you know, I mean it felt great for her to say that, but also the fact that I was able to say, Yeah, I tried it and I and I've done this. So um it's a different metric than right. then, um, like what success looks like is completely different when you're measuring it by impact than numbers and salary or position right. or all the things that maybe we were focused on earlier. I mean, I look at it this way, right? Sometimes people don't realize the success they get from doing something until sometimes much later, right? We live in a world where people are constantly focused on instantaneous gratification. Like, where are the results? You know, I'm sure, I mean, we see it all the time in marketing, right? Um, where people spend money and they're like, where's the sales? Right. Uh, pull the ad. We're not seeing anything. And it's like, it's been three days. Like, give it a minute. People I need to kind of see it a little bit longer to let it sink in and then drive them to something, right? And sometimes I think with some of the things we're doing, right? Sometimes to your point, success may not necessarily be in the clicks or trending on Twitter overnight or whatever it is, right? It's like the fact that your daughter saw that and you know what? She may hold on to that for the rest of her life. And when she gets through those crucial growing moments in her life, in her teenage and early 20s and so on and so forth, that thought of you doing something and making it happen for yourself will stick in her mind more than, you know, whatever views you got on it. And that would be much more important for you and valuable to you if she could get that from it, you know? Right. And then, you know, the other side is, is you, 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 I don't know if it's happened to you, but I have thought about mortality. I have thought about that. What, what do I leave behind for my daughters to know who their father was or what did he like or what was he into? Um, I'm blessed to have my father still around, but I have those questions about him. Like, who are you? So <laughs> man of mystery. Um, and that's fine. You know, the different generations, different, different styles. But I, I did think about also just sort of leaving them something where they could have a sense of, of what, um, what, what went to, but, you know, I'm sure you've seen this about them having a voice is that. Yeah, I'm the dad. So, oh, how was your day? And what did you learn? And what did you do? And they'll flip it on me. They'll be like, but dad, how was work? Okay, what did you do today? What did you learn today, fine. dad? What's fine? What's fine look like? What does that mean? What did you do? Oh, I had a couple of calls. What were the calls about? Right, right. They're like, uh-huh. And how did you feel, dad? Did you have a good day? And I'm like, <laughs> Yeah, they do that to us, too. So, how did you do that? It's like, Oh, good. You were there. You saw it, right? Yeah, I just saw you on the computer. What exactly were you doing? Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, my, my daughter's asking me, so how, how, do, how do you get people to buy stuff? I'm like, oh, don't even stop. <laughs> <laughs> There's an answer, but there is no answer. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to say it, man. There is an answer, but there is no answer. Sometimes you 
just happens. It was the actually that was the worst idea that we came out of a meeting and we led with it for some strange reason. And guess what? It worked. It's a cold. People loved it. It worked. It worked. <laughs> it worked. Who knew? Honestly, I don't even know how it worked, honey. I can't even tell you. Like we didn't think it was gonna work, and it worked. Go figure. Yeah, it's true. It is true, man. Life in a nutshell. Well, thank you, Mr. Jameson, for your time this morning. Anytime, man. I appreciate the conversation, uh, the, the chance to be in this exclusive company uh, of select chosen few so far to this point in uh, Bobby Hosein for all So I appreciate it. And um, when you see a minivan slowly roll by your house, we'll have masks on just with the plates out for the brisket. <laughs> <laughs> You, you can leave the brisket by your by your mailbox. We will just take the brisket right, and right. roll roll on. You got it. Man. You got it. Yeah. All right, Steve. All right. Thank you. Have a good one.